Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki motherfucker. Everybody, welcome. My name is Matt, and I'm here with Andrew. Today, we're going to be talking about Die Hard and Die Harder, whether or not these are the only true Die Hard movies, and why John McClane still has no clout wherever he goes. So grab your popcorn and Reese's Pieces, and let's break it down on the post credit Podcast. It's just like, it's kind of the epitome of the good, wholesome father. You know what I mean? I mean, I know he's a cop and everything else, and he doesn't take care of himself. I mean, obviously, no matter what, in probably in real life, he doesn't take care of himself, but but definitely doesn't take care of himself like in the movies because like You're talking about with his eating habits, yes, yes, with all that's, those that's, Twinkies he likes. Yes. And obviously, like I mean, him being a cop, I mean, I, I've seen these three or four hundred pound cops before. I think that he's been a cop in like four shows or yeah. four properties. You know, like a, yeah. mo- a couple movies, Die Hard, Die Harder, and then uh, there's Family Matters. And another one. Do you remember when the dad from Fresh Prince uh, came in to the yeah. Family Matters house? No. So what it was was that, you know, like towards... I, mean, I used to love this show, by yeah. the way. I was just saying. So like towards the end of Family Matters, you know, they'd have like the credits and everything. Um, and you'd have some... Every once in a while, you'd have kind of a blooper or whatever yeah. during the credits at the very end. And uh, somebody was supposed to pop in. I think it was Urkel or something was supposed to pop in. But then suddenly, out of nowhere, <laughs> yeah. Uncle, Uncle Phil pops into the Family Matters house. And he, he passed and, away pretty recently. And he just he? kind of stood there and, like, and the whole cra- <laughs> the, the <laughs> studio audience was cheering and stuff. And obviously Red, the same yeah. network, right? What's that? They're obviously both on the same network. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah. So And the Reginald Vell Johnson just lost it. He just started laughing and everything. Yeah. And, uh it was just kind of like a little blooper outtake type of thing where he visited the set because they get so they get compared. Well, back then they did. They got yeah. so compared. What was his name? From the Fresh Prince? Yeah, the Uncle Phil guy. Uh, um, I'll have to look that's it up. That's a classic. But, I mean, seriously, like growing up when I was a kid, I remember watching Family Matters like religiously. I love that show, you know. And, and, and it, because he was such a good dad, he plays that such a good – Good person, you James know. James Avery is the Uncle James Phil. Avery, that's right, that's right. But, but he plays, you know, Reginald plays very good, wholesome, you know, um, fatherly <clears throat> type figures. If you notice, even even with John McClane, very trusting. Yeah, and even with John McClane here, he was very, you know, John McClane didn't trust anybody. Like he was in he was in a state that's totally different, you know, from California to New York. You know, nowadays they're pretty much really remotely close. You know, I mean, as far as beliefs and things like that but right. back then you know you had new yorkers and californians and both both them do not click you know what i mean and john mcclain comes over and he just automatically clicks with this this california guy even though he's a new yorker you know what i mean yeah and and, and but it just because he didn't trust anybody john mcclain didn't even trust his own wife for that matter you know what i mean like miss Gennaro. Like, like he was so yeah miss Gennaro, things like that but he automatically trusted you know this this Bumbly cop that was getting a bunch of Twinkies at the gas station and ran his tr- uh, his cop car off of uh, a little cliff. Well, he heard, yeah, he heard his voice. He's got that very uh, welcoming, trusting, trusting voice. voice. Yeah. And, you know, he could tell that, you know, you could tell pretty much within a few minutes of talking to somebody whether they're kind of dumb or yeah. whether they're... You know, just you can get kind of a, a sense of their character. And, and you really kind of believed his backstory is why he was, you know, kind of like basically just a, a what do they call him, a foot patrol type cop. Paper pusher. Yeah, paper pusher yeah. cop, you know. and, and uh, he, he sat at a desk. He Yeah, and, and that's the biggest thing is that, you know, you, you trusted him. He he, tr- mm-hmm. he trusted him like full force. And well, when he told that horrible story, I mean, that's one of yeah. those. Type of thing. But you knew that, that there was something there, you know, I mean, and, and they didn't have to say any kind of backstory with him, but they had to make that relationship between those two, you know, more cemented in, you know, so he had to have, Reginald had to have some sort of backstory in, in, in this movie, you know, uh, let, let's just call him Pal. Uh, yeah, it was Al, Al Pal. Al Pal. But, uh, you know, he, just Al alone. It, it just it, they clicked they clicked automatically you know and it, and again just to so that al was you know he wasn't kind of a main character but he kind of was you know in a way right but but they they had to give him that kind of backstory you know some some really i mean they could have said anything they could have been like 
his gun went off in his pocket or something, you know? <laughs> but no, he shot a kid, you know? and Premature. Yeah. Yeah, or something, whatever. But yeah. he, he just, he, he shot that, you know, a kid and, you know, I'm sorry if, if I was a cop and I did that, I probably would never be a cop again. I, probably I was going to say, I'd probably gun. quit. Although he kind <clears> of, <throat> excuse me, he kind of did the equivalent to that. I mean, riding a desk, you're basically, you're not out on the True. streets. All you're doing is filing paperwork. And he had a baby on the way. Yeah. He had to probably qualify to carry a gun because that's what you got to do for cops. But I mean, he was never out on a beat yeah, or anything and, and, like and, and that. Again, and he you had know, a baby. He, yeah. And, and it's, it's it, you see, you know, and probably a lot of people don't talk about this movie, but these cops in this city were a bunch of idiots. Like, Al was the only one with any kind of sense. I mean, even when they brought the FBI, were a bunch of, you know, it was almost like they were trying to say, okay, you know, the FBI. Made it look like NYPD gets nobody, stuff done, no stealth, LAPD no sucks. Stealth. Like, zero stealth whatsoever. And then even trying to shut down a grid in the power was just like, you had like, uh, you know, Bubba, Bubba, Bubba no sense, you know, trying to shut off the whole in, grid. You know, and he's like, I'm going to get fired. Well, I don't care. Shut it off. You know, and it's like, but all these cops were. You were jumping all, way ahead. Well, I, I know. I know. But I'm just talking about it. You know. No, I know. <clears throat> the, 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 the cops there were just a bunch of idiots. Like, 100%. Like, I was the only one with any kind of sense. Whatever. And even the, the, the guy, the sergeant or the, what was it, assistant, uh, police chief or something whatever that character was uh who was it it was um wait for who are you talking about the the guy that was kind of in charge of the cops not, not so much the <coughs> Dwayne uh, t robinson or Dwayne robinson or whatever you're talking about the, the guy who told pal to shut up basically right yeah yeah uh Dwayne Dwayne, Dwayne, Ro- pa- pa- yeah, Paul Dwayne robinson yeah yeah he uh he was just really He's like I'm Captain Dwayne T. Robinson or whatever. Yeah, but then he, I think when he got his power strip from him, you know, by the FBI or whatever, he was just kind of like, uh, I, th- I think we were kind of making some mistakes here. Well, that, not only that, but he's like, oh, they're gonna do that, and then, then whenever they crash, he's like, I think we're gonna need more FBI guys. Just kind of like real funny about it, like not <laughs> yeah. really caring that they died. Yeah, because he he pretty much got to the point where he was just like, okay, everything's out, nothing's in control here. The, these criminals obviously have thought all this through. And there's no way that they know what uh, we're, we're obviously just outbrained here, you know, because right. they had no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> so we've been we've been out for two or three weeks and, you know, it's just been one of those unavoidable things where we just get hammered <clears throat> every time we try to record. So glad to finally be back in the studio. Glad to finally be getting this episode done. We're going to have to postpone some other things that we had in our schedule and everything, but at least we're back now and this episode we're going to be doing die hard and die harder also known as die hard part two um so you know this season we're trying to just do 90s movies and this is a cheat because the first die hard movie came out in 1988 Uh, but the second one was in 1990 and the following three other ones were also in the 90s and the rest and well Well, no one the last one was in like 2000 right Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, I think uh, it only went up to three, and then I think the one with Timothy Oliphant, um, what was it, part four, I can't remember what it was called, Live Free or Die Hard, I think. Yeah, Live Free or Die Hard. Yeah, that came out in the early 2000s, and then you had the I really liked Russian that. one, which is like early 2010s. The Russian one, one did not out. feel like a Die Hard movie at all. No, I didn't really like Live Free or Die Hard, but <clears throat> I mean, I like Timothy Oliphant, anything that he does, and him as a villain in that movie was kind of weird. But I mean, you know, it was good to see him. It was cool to see some uh, some little back and forth with Kevin Smith and uh, <laughs> and Bruce Willis before they hated each other, because that's what they met in the Live Free and Die Hard. Well, I mean, that's the first time like they really worked yeah. together, and then after that, Bruce Willis did cop out with yeah. that Kevin <laughs> Kevin well, Smith and, directed, and it was just and, he just had nothing but bad things to say about and, Bruce and see, Willis. A, a lot of people are like that with Bruce Willis because you know, and, and and mostly if you ever hear anybody talking bad about Bruce Willis, it's another man. Okay, another the reason man. the reason I say that though is because you know Bruce Willis is the epitome of the man's man in Hollywood, the, the everyman. Yeah, the everyman in Hollywood. I mean, he's not super strong or super fast or you know a super genius because I mean as we can tell with these Die Hard movies he basically gets through the Die Hard movies by the seat of his pants you know his character does well the first three he did 
Live free or die hard. He's throwing helicopters. He's throwing motorcycles at helicopters. That was awesome. He I'm was jumping. He was jumping on these hover jets. He was. De- I mean, the live free or die he hard. Dro- and he, then the first one he jumped off a building, Matthew. And then you know, connect. Con- what's the other one? Die hard in Russia, whatever it was called. Those two's just suck. I'm sorry, but they suck. I disagree with you. Because the last one, yes. No, because when you're when you're then he's like a legitimate action star. He's no longer John McClane. That's not John McClane. Not throwing helicopters at people. Not jumping on jets. That's not the Everman. That's I some, disagree with you. No, that's some Stallone shit. That's some Schwarzenegger stuff. You know, that's not and and I, I think you know a lot of that's that's what a lot of reviewers gave these these movies bad remarks for is because you know this didn't feel like the same character anymore like it did in die hard die hard 2 even in the third one he didn't feel as every man as the first two the um what was uh, die hard with a vengeance yeah um you know even in that movie he was more of a um, he was kind of the everyman, but he was also very grumpy, depressed, down. Whereas in the first two, you know, he he was dealing with some stuff. But I mean, this this was the uh, you know, Die Hard with Invention was like the last one where he was like kind of slowly going into the silent, brooding action type, and not and and losing his everyman, jokey, quippy type of of sensibilities. Well, I call I call him much cut- completely had lost in the last two. Well, in Die Hard with Vengeance, I call him like. You know he's he's the country singer. If you think about it, you know in Die Hard and Avengers, his his dog left him, his wife left him. You know he lives in a one bedroom apartment or whatever. You know I mean he his kids don't talk to him. I mean he he's just uh, always constantly drunk. Apparently his wife barely talks to him. Yeah, and so I I think you know in a way it's kind of like a country song. You know with with him, but I I feel like like the Die Hard Live Free or Die Hard was the last one in my opinion, just for the simple fact that you know it it was. Again, he was basically getting by barely, you know, by the seat of his pants. You know what I mean? And there, because because in all the movies, than he's been in the past, though. But to a point, yeah. But you got to understand, you know, this is like what thirty years after the you know, the first two, you know, um, well, or not not thirty years. I'm sorry. Uh, it was about ten years after the first two, and so you know, you got to understand, he's probably got a lot more experience. He's got a lot more people, you know. A lot of people know his name. I just you know? think the stakes were too high in Leaf, Live Free or Die Hard. You know, it's it's the, the first two, he's in, you know, the first one, he's in Nakatomi building, but there's maybe like 12 to 15 terrorists that he's dealing with. I mean, that's, that's outnumbered and stuff, but for a cop and for a seasoned cop, it might not be too bad, and he just has, happens to be a especially good cop. So, I mean, he's doing pretty good. At the airport, there's, again, only a few terrorists. Now, that's amping it up a bit because now you're involving the secret military group that's actually bad guys that we'll get into and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, for the most part, the stakes were high because it was the plane's landing. But, I mean, he was in one place. It was one situation. That's how both those first two movies are. The third one is kind of like that. It's one situation, but, I mean, it's all over the city. They're doing this by themselves. They're very organized, the bad guys. But there's only a certain amount of them. And, you know, the, the, the third one, the live free or die hard, or I mean the fourth one, the live free or die hard, I mean the stakes are like global, right? This is something that like the CIA should be going after or right. the FBI or whatever. I mean, not some New York. Now, you could say that with the other two, but I mean – it's feasible for and, and you know first of all he's in situations where he has to be by himself yeah. doing these things or whatever whereas in the third one i mean or even in live free and die hard the russian one you know it just seemed like it was too much for this john mcclain character They're just trying to take him too far that's my opinion well and like i said you know i mean this is one of those things where it's we we can you know we disagree on this one you know we i agree mean to disagree yeah and and <clears throat> But I'm you, right, but I mean we no, can ad- anyways, agree to disagree. But ha- have you one noticed one thing? And this is not me being, you know, racist at all. I'm just letting you know. No, I'm okay. saying you're racist. The now fir- I'm automatically going to think <laughs> okay. that you're going to be racist. The first movie, right? You had you had Reginald's character mm-hmm. as kind of like his his sidekick in a way. You know what I mean? And then in the second one, you had that that other gentleman. Uh, Sidekick or the computer. What do they call it in the new Spider-Man Homecoming? <sighs> the the guy in the chair? Oh. Uh, Didn't they call Ned, Spider-Man's friend, Ned, the guy in the chair? Because he was the one yes. doing the computer stuff yeah. in the Homecoming movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Reginald will be like his guy in the chair. Yeah, and then and then he has. Uh, kind he, of. In, in the, the next one, he has. Uh, what was that guy that worked at the. 
the oh the janitor dude the janitor guy i mean he kind of uh, but he also still had Powell though too i mean he was still able to call yeah. him and 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 ask him for some yeah. uh you know to get the fingerprints or whatever it may be yeah but then in the third one he's got samuel l jackson who becomes more of a not so much a side character as kind of like a tango and cash type uh running you know what i mean like where you know samuel jackson helps him and then and then then in the uh in the and then the third one or the fourth one you have justin long so you ha- you've got you got you got these three strong uh justin you know long. kind of black actors Marvin the first, was the janitor. Yes, in yes. Part two. In the first three, and then you get Justin Long in the in the fourth one, yeah. and 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 you're just kind of like because you had Pal the first two. Yeah, movies. And, and, although although Marvin the janitor he was a white dude. What 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 was was he the? What, but he did still call Al Pal because the, the jacket. Remember, yeah, he gave the jacket, you know, or something, you know. But it was just like it was it was kind of like part of the movie that they had to have a kind of a strong sidekick type I can't I hate to say a sidekick but kind of a, a strong support. side support character right you know what I mean and 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 then then you get into like I said you get Justin Long who's a pretty much worthless throughout that entire movie you He's know just scared I, yeah. and I remember when everybody thought that he was gonna play John McClane's son oh I know and then and he then, ends up and, like hooking up with his daughter or something yeah, and then know? it became in part Five, it was what Jai Courtney. Yeah, I don't know why. How well, that was his son. That was actually his son. Right, right. Why do people keep trying to make Jai Courtney happen? I don't know. I mean, I mean, you know, he surprised me with Captain Boomerang in Suicide Squad. No, it's funny. Like, it was funny. That's what I'm saying. He did funny. good. He was like yeah. one of the best parts of that movie because that movie, for me, in my opinion, yeah. that movie was atrocious. But. He was one of the shining lights in that yeah. because he was hilarious in that. Wasn't he in he Divergent? He was always like trying to crack a beer and everything. Too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he, he, everybody, you know, Hollywood with Divergent, with uh, the Terminator movies, all that kind of stuff. They're, you know, they're, they're trying to make this Jai Courtney thing happen. And I'm just like, it never hits. Is that, isn't He's he better like Australian as like a supporting guy. Yeah, I think so. He's yep. better as like a supporting guy or even a villain or a supporting villain or whatever. Like he yeah. wasn't Divergent or whatever. But yeah. I don't know. He, I just, I can't. He just bores me. Yeah, but I mean, have you noticed again with these with these movies? He he tends to John McClane always has some sort of support character that's in his movies yeah. that really you know. Well, he has to because you got to hear him talk. You have to yeah. because either that he'd just be talking to himself, which happens a little bit in the first Die Hard and everything, but. To be able, you got to have your main character talk. I mean, well, this, I mean, look at Predator, okay, with with Arnold, right? One of the greatest uh, action movie stars. Literally in that movie, after everybody else dies, like the continuation of that, the ending of that movie, nobody talks. But with the him, that's okay because at that point, early in his career, you didn't want him talking no, that much no, because no. you couldn't understand a lot of it. I mean, bottom line, we're, we're we're not here to talk about all the Die Hard movies. We're here to talk about the first two. So. We're here to talk about part one and part two. And speaking of. Not him, him and uh, Bruce Willis not having anybody to talk to. <clears throat> this movie was actually based off of a book called Nothing, Nothing Lasts Forever by uh, Roderick Thorpe. And this is the first one. Right, right. Die Hard uh, was based on this, this book called Nothing, Nothing Lasts Forever. And it's actually, the book is actually a sequel to an, another book the same writer wrote called The Detective. Mm-hmm. So it, it wasn't about a detective named John McClane. It was about uh, a detective named uh, Leland something. I can't remember. I think it's like Joe Leland or something like that. Yeah. So, um, but they could just call him Leland. Uh, and uh, and so that was the detective. Now that got turned into a movie with Frank Sinatra like 20 years before this or something yeah. like that. Um, so anyways, uh, Frank, Frank Sinatra played this character, uh, Leland, in, in The Detective. Now when they started making, started writing Die Hard, um, you know, the, the, the author specifically wrote uh, Nothing Lasts Forever as a sequel so they would turn it into a movie. So like yeah. basically like all the action from about two thirds of the way or a third of the way in, so like the last two thirds, it's all basically like verbatim from the book. Yeah. Even though the character's name and some of the situations are different, yeah. so it's about this uh, this this New York this retired New York police detective, <clears throat> and he's going to uh, L.A. to spend Christmas with his daughter, not his wife. 
Yeah. Um, and she's the one that works with a high powered yeah. businessman and has a guy who is a drug addict and gave her a watch and all this kind yeah. of stuff, just like in the movie. But, you know, it's, it's replaced with his wife in this one. Yeah. But so when they were started making this one, they were because of the contracts that that were done for the movie of the detective with Frank Sinatra, they had to offer Frank Sinatra the part since it was a sequel from this book or from from the detective or whatever. They actually had to offer the part to Frank Sinatra first, who was then in his 70s when this came out. So he turned it down and they were able to retool the script to be a younger detective, not not retired, going to see his wife and his kids at Christmas and his wife is the one at the party. So, um, yeah, like I said, this comes from a book. So, you know, in the book you have the inner monologue of the character right, talking right. to himself. And in the, the movie, you, you you can't have that. You can't show that, really. So, you know, you have to have him talking to somebody else. So, you know, I thought that was very interesting um, that, you know, it was supposed to be some kind of aging, retired, you know, New York police uh, officer. And, um, you know, it, it, it they ended up kind of retooling it after, uh, I mean, can you imagine what this movie would look like if it was Frank Sinatra? It, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. <clears throat> I mean, for the simple thing is, I mean, because, you know, Frank, Frank Sinatra is known as, as the dapper one. You know, I mean, he's known as the one that, you know, it doesn't matter if he's doing gardening outside or mowing the lawn or playing football. He's wearing a, a suit and tie. You know what I mean? And, and like an and, Ocean's Eleven yeah, or whatever. Oh, Blue Eyes, you know, he, he's... Uh, He's known for being very dapper of a human being. Yeah, so we I mean? probably would have gotten a different character or a different, a different, a guy going about it a different way. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at the the his the villain in this, you know, he's Mr. kind Hans of Gruber. Hans Gruber is very. Uh, he's the dapper, you know, wearing the suit and tie, you know, not not really getting his hands dirty besides killing people. I mean, obviously, but you know, um, he's kind of the. The dapper one. So if you had a character like Hans Gruber and Frank Sinatra, it probably wouldn't be a very entertaining movie, you know? No, that's true. Uh, speaking of um, uh, Hans Gruber, played by... Snape. <laughs> Snape. So he's played by Alan Rickman. Um, this was Alan Rickman's first major film role. Which is insane to me because... Let's see, let's see. Uh, he was a He was a stage actor before this, and he was in his 40s, during yeah. this role so his very That's first hollywood role up. yeah was he was like 41 or something like that but yeah he was in his 40s for this role and it was his first ta- and you know he was kind of nervous about it because he didn't know if he wanted his first major role the hollywood role to be as a villain yeah um and it's like that's kind of what he built his career he off of that, that, that so either well. villains or dark anti-hero anti-heroes, type people yeah you know, definitely anti- like snape or whatever but yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting, and for for it being his first major film gig, I mean, yeah. he did an amazing job. And you know, and the thing is, is I mean, for for the t- the caliber of his acting, I mean, he's probably the greatest actor in this film out of any actors to date. He's probably in my book would be probably the greatest actor in in in, in this film. You know, in the first one, like I can't name one actor. I mean, even Bruce. You don't Willis. like Johnson and Johnson. You don't like. Agent Johnson, the special agent Johnson. <laughs> well, what, what? Yeah, I mean, I, I always think that like, yeah, those guys were idiots. I mean, they were just straight up idiots. But you know, it, it just I, I think his caliber of acting, even in this film, was just phenomenal. I mean, his, his American accent was um, pretty spot on. I'd have to say from going from from because you know if if you don't weren't raised around somebody that was British like we were. You can see, you can't tell the differences between British uh, accents. You know, different that's what parts I wanted to bring country. up. Is like, why is it, okay? So they were all German, right? Yeah, they're all German. His name's Hans Gruber and everything. So I was like, well, he was like, why does he have a British accent? And I, I guess it could be explained away. Maybe in the movie, maybe I missed it because I know they bring up his dossier somewhere in the movie, yeah. but. Maybe he spent time growing up in England, and that's Probably. why he's got an English accent. Maybe because I mean he seemed very well educated. Well, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people like going going to Harvard here in the United States is like going to Cambridge for Europe. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, you see a lot of these characters and a lot of these actors and a lot of these, you know, real life people that, you know, come from countries like India and Japan and, and you know, from a lot of the Arab countries will go to England and study at Cambridge yeah. because it's, you know, the, the top of the top right there. I mean, it, to be honest with you, it's probably the best college in, in the world. You know, I mean, right. it's one of the oldest ones, you know, I know that much, but. You know, it's 
a lot of these actors and a lot of these characters and a lot of these people go, you know, study abroad, you know, and that, that, that includes, you know, studying England and stuff. But, you know, again, being raised by somebody who is British, we can tell the dialects, you know, it, it, the difference in the dialect in, in, in the English, you know, British language, I guess you could say. Right. Like, I, I can tell you if somebody's Scottish, Irish, uh, Australian, or British, you know, mm-hmm. and, and even then... You can always tell, you know, from somebody's from the north or from say, the there's south. Different, you know? There's different dialects. Yeah, and and you can tell he's the northern one have has the more closest to like a Scottish right. type of accent. Right, and, and he's got more of a he's got more of a proper English accent. You know, his his, his British accent's very very proper. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where you get somebody like you know uh, what what uh, uh, Sid Vicious or something. <laughs> Uh, on the other side of it, you know, or or, or anybody from like the movie Snatch, you know or I mean? from the show Eastenders, yeah. or something like that. <laughs> yeah, the the hardcore or the uh, harsh uh, London accent, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know what's a perfect example of that? Love Actually, because you see Hugh Grant, the way he speaks, uh, his his Very British, posh, and then the Liam girl Neeson, that he likes. And, yeah, and the girl he likes, and and a lot of these different you know people in that <laughs> movie that have different. Let me see my fucking coat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but they all have different types of British accent, and and that's the same thing with 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 Alec Rickman is he's so good and and you know like and again he's in Love Actually you know and he's very he's still very proper in that and then you know Harry Potter same wasn't, way I was gonna say wasn't Alan Rickman and Harry Potter doing something in that that movie <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> like his greatest role you mean <laughs> um, so I mean he did really good I mean, he had a the the British accent. Uh, with with the 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 German uh, you know lineage or whatever, yeah. so that that confused me. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and everybody around him were were there was a guy from China, there was a guy that was uh, seriously from Germany. I mean, like had the strong German accent, and then you had him. Well, <laughs> I mean, then, you had like had Carl Americans. and Heinrich and all yeah. this kind of stuff. Well, see, when this movie came out in Germany, yeah, see what these terrorists became were um, I think they became Irish terrorists ah. so they ch- the Germans uh, when it came out in Germany they changed it to an Irish terrorist I think uh, Hans was like Tom or John or something like that um, I think Heinrich got turned turned to Henry yeah Carl got like I don't know it, it was they changed all their names so they weren't German names and they became Irish yeah so I don't know how they I, you know, I, in the dubbing or whatever of the language, I'm sure they changed a few things and everything. But I was, you know, when I, when I read that, I was like, man, yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. I never even thought about, you know, when you have terrorists from a certain country, what happens when it comes yeah. out in that country? Yeah. How do they do they just roll with it or do they just switch? It, you know, in the in the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the translate. Well, what, what, what would we talk about? Uh, what was the Final Destination one that was called Final Destination in? Uh, Japan or something, and uh, what was it originally called? Oh, Asian com- countries have such awesome names for yeah. for some of their their movies, like some of their action movies. Oh my gosh, it's like you know, kick kick punch face smacker or something like you know. I mean, it's just you know, they they, they come up with some great. I mean, I don't know if it's just because of the translation or what. But they yeah. come up with such great action movie names. Well, and see, I watch a lot of anime, right? And so, you know, you can watch it in several different ways. You know, you can watch it dubbed, which is basically English um, it translated, you know, and they're speaking English. And then, you know, or you can watch it subbed, which is actually in Japanese, but it, you got the subtitles on there, right? Right. And you miss a lot. You miss a lot. Unless you watch the sub version instead of the dub version, uh-huh. you miss so much, you know, uh, a lot. it doesn't translate well. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and with this, you know, with this type of movie and action movies in general, you got to have the proper translation or else it doesn't work, yeah. you know? And, and and did you notice one thing with these Die Hard movies? There's there's a lot of foreboding, you know, for the following movies. Uh, what do you mean foreboding? Well, like, you know, he's on a plane in the first one, right? And, you know, they make an effort instead of him just arriving into the he's in the airport and then he goes back to the airport and you know, it's just kind of like, for, and then in the third one, it's Han's brother, and you know, in, in the fourth one, it was uh, they know John McClane, who John McClane is, and you know, you would think that a guy like John McClane would be extremely famous. That's what I was going to think about. Is is is, uh, you know, he he uh, ha- he's done all these things, right? 
But like, you know, in the second movie, they're like, oh, yeah, I heard about that stunt you pulled at Nakatomi yeah. Tower. And, you know, that and stunt. And uh, the you third saved one, 100 people, but that stunt. Yeah. And then the third one, you know, it was kind of referencing back. But I mean, you had you had the terrorist talking more about it because yeah. that was his brother and everything. But, you know, that was just very briefly mentioned in the fourth one. It was very. Uh, I don't know, even know if it well, was well, mentioned. Uh, what have you done? All the thought pre- knew who you was. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I mean, like, but I mean, it wasn't like a world-renowned thing where like everybody knew who John McClane is. But I mean, it, if that really happened in real life, everybody in the world would know who John McClane is. You yeah, know what I mean? The guy writing. probably would never have to work again. But I mean, the that, first one. that's not who John McClane would have been. Yeah, though. He, he he could have written books. He could have done talk shows, all that kind of stuff. But you know, he would have just rather been a cop. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that they, they really saved his character in those other movies, but, you know. Yeah, well, idea. and in the first one, you know, I mean, he ride, he gets on a plane. He's got that big-ass bear with him, and, you know, he carries this bear and gets picked up in the limo, you know, by some, um, I, I want to say, like, an extremely random character in a movie, you know, like his limo driver, right? Uh-huh. Like, yeah, he kind of he kind of stopped him at the end, you know, but that wasn't, because that, that was their original plan, you know, not to go off the helicopter. They just wanted to get a diversion for the helicopters and then just drive right out the garage. You know, that was the deal. But then when you have... Uh, from the roof? You're yeah. You're talking about when they were going to yeah. the roof? Yeah, but then you have Argyle, who picks him up from the airport, you know, wearing his shades and his and his uh, his suit and everything else like that, you know, and John McClane's kind of giving him the side eye because he's like, hmm, uh, I'm from New York, and, and I know what, you know, certain characters could be like, you know, he he's very slick type character, you know, and... And let, let's get in the limo. He's probably mean, never been in a limo. Yeah, and the, I mean, he sat in the front seat. You well, know? yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know did I mean? you know in some countries it's like uh, considered an insult if you sit in the back seat? Yeah. Or and I, th- I bet it's in some countries it's probably an insult to sit in the front seat. Maybe it is. You know, it's just, it, it's it's. Uh, um, I don't know. E- either way, like I said, you know, he gets picked up in the airport, and he gets drove to Nak- Nakatomi Tower. Uh-huh. You know. And basically told to which just, was the fo- the new Fox building, by the way. Oh, yeah, okay. Because it was produced by Fox and yeah. everything, and that's they, why they the Brooklyn Nine Nine did a did an episode there, yeah. right? So they they were charging themselves for rent because they were still renovating, they were still yeah. building in it and everything. So yeah, all the actual scenes of of floors that aren't finished yet or were real floors real, in yeah. there that hadn't been finished yet and everything. So did you watch that Brooklyn Nine Nine episode where they go up into Nakatomi Tower? I don't think I did, but I do know that Andy Samberg's oh, character man. in that is obsessed with John McClane and yeah. Die Hard and it's yeah. the greatest. It's movie why he of became a cop time. and right, all that. Right. Yeah. But Can I read you some of these real quick? Go for it. So these are <laughs> these are um titles of uh of Hollywood movies and they have funny Asian translations. Uh, so in Japan, Bring It On came out as Cheers, and I just start thinking of sometimes you yeah. want to go where everybody knows. Uh, Japan, Napoleon Dynamite is Bus Man, <laughs> and that's because he was standing in front of a bus wow. in, the, in the poster. Wow. Um, let's see, Malaysia, it got changed from Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, to Austin Powers, The Spy Who Behaved Very Nasty Around Me, or Nicely Around Me. Oh, okay, okay, wait, wait, before you say anything else... That is a good translation, I think. No, I don't know. The spy who behaved very nicely around me. So, uh, you know, it, I don't know. That that's very. That's. It. I think that's fitting, though. I really. The spy do. who shagged me to the spy who behaved very nicely around me. Well, that's weird. Of course, they're dumbing it down a little bit because you know, I mean, again, I, from what I understand, you know, I don't know for a fact, but you know, the, the culture is very. Uh, that culture is very uh, a lot more stricter than Americans, I could say. American Pie in China was American Virgin Man. Um, Makes sense. I mean, none, none know, of we have don't we have secret sense. we have secret Agent Man, and they have uh, American Virgin Man. Uh, Japan Despicable Me got turned into Mysterious Thief Gru's Moon Theft. Okay, I mean that's that's just a little on the nose on that one, but you know, <laughs> Thailand is uh, Meet the Parents, Little Fockers is Zany Son in Law, Zippy Grandkids, Sour Father in Law. <laughs> hey, you know what? I I could actually work for this company that names these things. I mean, it's, <laughs> in Japan, as good as it gets, uh, it's says it's as good as it gets. Uh, uh, a romance novel writer, uh, romance novel writer. That's that's what it was in Japan. <laughs> Um, and in China, as good as it gets, was Mr. Cat Poop. 
<laughs> Anyways, oh there, there's tons of those, but yeah. I love watching. I love reading some of the uh, translations. Yeah. They're hilarious. Well, again, but. I watch anime, so it's it, it is translated like that, and it's ridiculous to that point. Yeah. But no, anyway, so he, you know, Argyle drives him there, and then John McClane pretty much just says, "Hey, wait in the car." <laughs> Wait in the car. Yeah, I mean, they, well, they have a deal. And she, he says, if things start going right, you let me know. I'll head out. If they're not, I'll hang around just in case, and I'll take you to a hotel if you yeah. need to. And yeah. he's like, yeah, oh, you're a stand-up guy, Argyle. Yeah. And, you know, he he, he turns on the rap Christmas music, and he's like, does he awesome. have any Christmas music? He's like, Some this run, is Christmas run music. Run DMC, baby. See? Yeah, and then you're like, man, I really am in, in L.A., but that's, like, more of a New York thing. Yeah. But uh, anyways, uh, but yeah, so, you know, we, we have this. Let me let me go ahead and give our credits here. Uh, so Die Hard came out in 1988. It was directed by John McTiernan, who had just done Predator uh, a year before this, I believe. Um, and so obviously he had some clout. Um, this was uh, the the writers were it was written by well of course the book was written by Roderick Thorpe um, and then uh, Jeb Stewart uh, did the uh, screenplay for it. Uh, it stars Bruce Willis as John McClane, Bonnie Bedelia as Holly McClane or Gennaro, uh, Reginald Vell Johnson who we mentioned earlier, Sergeant Al Powell, Paul Gleason, uh, Devereaux White, William Atherton, and then uh, Alan Rickman of course. And then there's just like kind of a plethora of 80s movie. Um, extra bad guys you know that are in it that yeah. you've seen in tons you know oh, that yeah. some of them were probably in lethal weapon movies and and they probably were named hans or something, know, something, like, that, something like that or yeah. you know they're either from south africa or yeah you know, well, and, german or something and, like that can you actually think of like you know if somebody's named hans you know automatically think german right, right. but at the same time like since i guess probably because hans was, booby yeah, yeah. This is, this is, oh, that guy was so annoying. Yeah. Do, but you, do you recognize what he was from? No. And do you want me to come back yeah, to it so it, you can finish your thought? No. Or is your thought it. already gone? No, I got it. I got it still. <laughs> so, okay, so you don't remember the Ellis, the the, the coke-snorting guy yeah. in the first movie? Yeah. Um, he played a boyfriend of a character in a superhero movie in the 80s. Superhero movie in the eighties. Yeah, not really a boyfriend, but maybe a crush of a superhero. Oh, man, I mean, I mean so P- Punisher was in the eighties, no, right? A crush of a superhero. So he was crushed on by a superhero. So Wonder Woman? No. I mean, because I'm trying to think. There's only superhero. like one thing that really came out in a movie back in the eighties. Oh man! And we talk about her all the time, every once in a while on the show. Supergirl. Ah, okay. So, do you remember wow. he was the one picked up by the bulldozer, by the witches who were trying to control? Because remember the one witch, she really wanted this guy to yeah. be her little manservant, and he was he was the one that she had kind of crushed on and everything when yeah. he first got there. But then wow. he, he she put him under his, her mind control, and she picked him up with those. Which, by the way, dumpsters. she doesn't have that power. Just saying. well, the uh, the the bad guy witch chick. Oh, it's oh, the, her. Yeah, I was about to say. Remember, like, she was controlling all those construction equipment oh, and right. brought him to life so and scooped him up movie. and brought him back to her and everything, but then Supergirl had to come and save him and everything. Yeah, that was Coke Snort and Ellis from, uh, oh, from Die Hard. Okay. You'll, it, you'll, you'll recognize him again, I'm sure, if you watch it again, but... Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, like, okay, with, with the with the whole name Hans, you know, like, I, it's probably because, you know, I was about seven when this movie came out. And, uh... You know, Hans, to me, to this day, Hans, I, I just think Hans Gruber. You know, I mean, it's just Hans is a bad guy. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's just kind of like a Hans bad guy Christian name. Anderson, uh, Hans Zimmer. But besides that, well, it's let's see much if Hans anybody Gruber. in our audience really knows who those two people. I know who those two people are, but I'm not giving not giving credit to our audience. But really, who you know? Come on now. Yeah. But but anyway, so he he gets into that garage, and. You know, he, he's, you know, given the deal, Argyle and him have that deal, and then he goes in there and he just, you know, takes a shower, because again, that's part of the plot. Did he take know. a shower or did he just clean up? Oh, he just cleaned up, that's right, but yeah. he was going to, like, do something. Or but, but, well, They were talking about, well, are you going to stay here, are you going to go to a hotel, yeah. are you going to stay with your captain, captain friend who retired or yeah. whatever. But the, the whole reason that they did that is to make sure he didn't have shoes on, right? Right, well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's part of the plot. The, that was yeah, the main he, part of the plot. He had to... Uh, Mess him up because there's construction. Obviously, yeah. there's going to be lots of shooting, a lot of glass, yeah. and everything. You got to slow him down somehow. You got to. It's almost a character in the movie. His feet His are feet. a character in the movie. I mean, it literally like shoot it, you... the glass. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. What was what was Come with that Carl dude? He didn't understand German. 
Does uh, Carl does Carl not speak I, German? I don't think Carl even knew who he was. Because I mean, remember when he goes shoot the Feinster or something like that, he he said something in German. It was shoot shoot the glass in German. But then Carl just kind of looked at him like he was an idiot, and, and uh, Hans kind of rolled his eyes and was like, shoot yeah. the glass, <laughs> and everything. And so I was like, oh, I guess that guy doesn't know German or something. But yeah. his brother did, because his yeah. brother was cursing him in, in, in German when he was cutting the phone lines with the, the yeah. chainsaw and everything. <laughs> And, and do you see the way he just did that? I mean, he's just slashing them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 it's just kind of one of those things where like this this building had zero security. I mean, for what it had. I mean, granted, it has a Christmas party, so there's probably less people there. They're still building on the building, you know. But it was just like he had what something like sixty five million dollars or something something like nowadays it wasn't as much as. You would think it was who, you know, who had sixty five million dollars. Like, in, in, or how much money was it that they actually were trying to steal? Oh, it was bonds, yeah. right? Yeah, it was like hundreds of millions, I believe. Yeah, but something like that, you know. But it was just like you would think with having that much money at that time period, you know, they'd have a hell of a lot more security than they did. I mean, granted, they had those stupid doors, but I even think that was kind of a plot hole in it. In the fact that they needed the the. The, the power shut to, off. Sh- power shut off just to get the last lock, I guess. So does that mean that <clears throat> their their extremely expensive and secure vault, anytime they have a power outage in their block, will it just pop open? Yeah, because I think California actually shuts your power <laughs> off at a certain time of night during the summer or something to save energy uh, or well, something. Maybe, so uh, maybe that, that wasn't back probably, then. Yeah. But I mean, I guess they did have the other locks that they had to go through, and it was just that major lock that comes down with the power. The or very something. one at the end, you know, or something. I don't know. Or the beginning of it was the. I, I don't know. I just, I'm sure you could justify it, but I'm sure you could yeah. poke holes in it as well. But so, anyways, he's he's cleaning up, and uh, again, you know not having shoes the whole reason that he was cleaning up was just so that he didn't have shoes on uh-huh. because i mean that that really carried some of the story i felt like you know and in, in a way you know it was kind of like he wasn't always at 100 percent. you know what i mean like like he was at about 75 percent right. well, I mean, he, he never drove had the there, right shoes never had never the right shoes. clothes he only had one gun could barely find guns Outgunned, and ran out of bill- bullets you know yeah and, um you know, mind you, when you have certain certain other action stars who stumble upon a cache of weapons and just start loading up, you know, like yeah. their commando yeah. or something. And you got to understand, like like Holly had to, you know, be pretty afraid at the beginning because, you know, up until that point, she just knew her husband as the New York City detective, right? right. So. You know they're they're kind of putting all their eggs in one basket with John McClane, and she's kind of like, like she knows though that he has the, the tenacity yeah. and the jackassery to refuse to be beaten. Yeah, yeah, and and you know what I think made his character so great was that he has there was no doubt in your mind that he would ever turn to the dark side. Right. You know what I mean? Like he was genuinely the good guy yeah. no matter what like he didn't do anything that would make him the bad guy in any shape or form in any of these movies i don't think you know i mean look at the third one you know he's trying to save these kids you know from the schools being right. blown up you know blown up or whatever you know i mean he he just does whatever it takes if, if that takes his life then that's what it is but you know he didn't know any of these people he knew his wife and he knew his wife's boss because he met her and then he knew that the coke addict you know but other than that you know like he was just a genuinely great person, you know what I mean, and, and just had had you know nothing but morals, you know. He did when it came to his job, <clears throat> right, right. When right. it came to his job, yes, he did. Yes. But he hated himself. It's self-destructive. Extremely. Yeah. He he, and you could tell he hated himself because after he started the argument with Holly and she left, he goes, he bangs his head. And he's like, "That's smart, real smart, John. Yeah, you know, way to go." You know, that type of thing. So, and, and I think that they talked about, the, the filmmakers actually talked about how this character, he he has, you know, his job on lock, but yeah. his personal life is just out of control. Like, you know, he ha- he hates the way he is and his, he hates yeah. the way that he talks to his wife and the way he is with his Not that he's like abusive or anything, but he's just a jackass. Yeah. And he refuses to come meet her in the middle with anything. And now, he knows he's a jackass. He knows that it... The reason that his marriage continuously does not work through any of these movies is because of him. It's, yeah, and it's, his bullheadedness. It, yeah. But it's that same bullheadedness that gets him through the situations that he has to continue through. And Correct. that's why eventually their marriage just stops working and eventually does fall apart in the later yeah. movies because 
he can't change that way that he is. And like he can right. come around and try to make himself better. And I think that they were at their best in part two. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, I, I that think, was the only time that we didn't see them, you know, not working. Yeah. And, and you know what? And I don't think you'll disagree with me. John McClane's one of the greatest characters in movies of all time. I mean, in my opinion. You know, when well, this is definitely the greatest the action hero. This is, I think, I it's been rated as the greatest action film of all time. Yeah, and and that I have no doubt in my mind on that. You know what I mean? I mean, just Die Hard in general. It's it's like, and and the name is so. Again, you know, we're talking about these translations between you know, like China and Japan and stuff. But I mean, this is really on the nose as far as the title of the movie die hard it's it, and i mean it should be called hard to die yeah, you know yeah, but because he's very hard to kill or yeah whatever. but it should I mean, be called hard to kill yeah hard to kill whatever but <laughs> that I would mean, make more sense than die hard. It, it's so on the nose but it works you know yeah, i think i remember when i was younger being really confused by the title i'm like die hard i'm like what does that mean does that mean that it's hard yeah. for him to die or that he dies really viciously or i'm like how does that mean but he, he's kind of like the poor man uh, James Bond in a way you know what I mean because like all the films are really you know what GoldenEye and then you know that but I mean I'm talking about like some of the older James Bond I mean it's really just kind of the titles is like why you know I mean I get what you're trying to say but you know it's just Goldfinger <laughs> you know come on now but you know it, it's it's kind of one of these things where he's kind of like the poor man's James Bond really you know what I mean? With because he doesn't have all the tools and all the tricks and stuff, but he just seems to pull it off. You know, like, like James Jason, Bond I feel just like pulls Jason it Bourne off. Jason Bourne is more like the poor man's. Uh, you know, I know that's like the American because he's version CIA, of James Bond. Yeah, okay, but you but, know, you got James Bond has his support crew. He's got his M. He's got his Q. Okay, okay, let's rate stuff. it like this. Then he's more. You know, James Bond and you know Jason Bourne's more, um, not universal, but world worldly you know where where john mcclain's more of the you know centralized smaller stage smaller stage yeah stuff yeah like a smaller version of it but you know just with the way that they set this movie on because it, it starts out slow right it starts out real slow and well, there's calm like 20 and, 25 minutes of building yeah but i mean within the first 20 minutes you get a sense of who john mcclain is and why he is the way he yeah. is yeah. you get a sense of what's going on with his relationship mm-hmm. what what the deal is why he's having to come out here for christmas and all that you get the sense of takagi of yeah. how he is you get the sense of how ellis acts and how yeah. he's going to be throughout the movie and gruber um, you get the sense of efficiency from from Hans's team and yeah. and the w- way the way they come in and take over the building and they're coming in from different angles and this guy's taking out this this guy's taking out that everything's very coordinated yeah. and planned out so we, and you know even Argyle stuff in the in the yeah. but I mean you got you have a very good sense of everything that's going to go on for the yeah. rest of the movie very good character development yep basically. and and all in just like these you know real quick beats yeah. of of and you know, it's like I said you know it's like you know maybe. 15 20 minutes of building before yeah. they really jump into what's going on yeah. but i mean it's all good setup because then then you <clears throat> then you can have all the action stuff yeah. and then you can concentrate on the bad guys mm-hmm. because you know what drives the good guys and what is 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 pushing them to go to go through this and the issues that our good guy is going through with his yeah. wife and all that kind of stuff they even thought of a good way of um, being able to keep his identity from Hans until yeah. the end of the movie by making her because they've had problems she stuck with the name Gennaro yeah so you know that was and, kind and of weird picture, that she did that and remember when he sees the picture that's kind of laying on the right well, on and the I counter. think I think like when it happened didn't she put the picture down yeah yeah because she kind of did it real yeah she kind of did it real sly and uh to put the picture down you know I mean, it kind of shows how smart she is too because she uh she was able to help with the ruse too, you know. But it, it, it you know, the, such great character development. Not only that, but she knew that with him causing problems, that she would be then yeah. pulled into it as a hostage or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, and, and what's great about this movie too is it just it gets you pumped. You know, I mean, you, you start watching the first, you're like, okay, this is good, this is good character development. You're dealing with the, you know, and it's a lot of what movies nowadays lack. You know, because they they don't do any kind of build up character development. In fact, you know, like in the early 2000s, they started doing the a lot of flashbacks. If you notice, you know, even in action films where it was like, you know, a lot of flashbacks to kind of get it caught up. And it's just like usually flashbacks are done with voiceovers yeah. with exposition. Yeah. 
And the first thing they tell you about filmmaking is show, don't tell. Yeah. So you have to show. If you have a bunch of talking and exposition, yeah. that's garbage. So, I mean, it has to be done sometimes. But when you have a movie that's <clears throat> using voiceovers and, and just explaining the plot by literally telling you what it the is only time instead of showing exactly. you. And then, th- exactly. And, and I think the only time... And I don't mean to try to interrupt you, but oh no, you're it's, good. I, I'm on a, I'm no, on a you're roll good. here. Yeah, I was just trying to. Uh, but add you know, to it. the only time I think that that has ever worked in my mind is Shawshank Redemption, because you don't really find out anything really about Andy until he's Andy really in, yeah, came until he's to Shawshank yes. prison in 1940. Literally, the only time, and, and the reason why that worked so well, and the reason why it worked is because it was written by Stephen King. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the, you had what's it was his name. From a book. Um, Who's the guy that adapted it? Um, he made The Walking Dead, too, at least the first couple seasons. Yeah. Uh, I'll think of his name later. Yeah. Uh, Frank Darabont, that's his name. Yeah, but, but you know, that works. And, and because it, they took it from the book and adapted it. it. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is going to bug me. You Probably keep, keep, keep going on but, your... your but I, I feel like that's the only time that works. But nowadays, they don't do that anymore. They don't develop the movie... You know, so that you get some understanding. Now, I'm not saying that it it, it doesn't ever work because you know there, there's been a lot of films that's come out ever since then with exposition. You mean there's lots of yeah. exposition? Or yeah, yeah. Well, well, no, where where they don't do any character development nowadays. Right. You know that it, it, I'm not saying that that's always the recipe for success, but no, it, just it made is. This, I think it is. Yeah, because I mean, if you have characters, why do I care about this character? Exactly. You need to tell me why I care about yep. this character or why I should care. That's um, why you care about Al. That's why you develop them. Yeah. And even if you have good development, some people just won't click with some with with certain audiences or whatever. Yeah. You know, you could develop them all you want, but some people just can't relate, can't can't connect, and everything. But yeah. I mean, with with this guy and and this situation, um, it was just perfectly written and perfectly paced. You know, they, they you have some people that call this the perfect action movie and they call it yeah. a perfect movie yeah because the villain is perfect the hero is perfect the situation is perfect the antagonists uh are perfect the, the little side antagonists like the fbi agent uh, uh fbi agents who kind of throw a, <laughs> Just call a wrench FBI idiots. yeah fbi idiots but i mean all the all the everything was was perfect basically yeah. is as well as how this movie is referenced quite often well i the I first th- one i kind of feel like they could have done a little bit more with hans I mean, I understand that the movie went about Hans, but the, I think the only kind of character development, I mean, yeah, the 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 guy that she worked for, Holly worked for, yeah, there wasn't a lot of, but th- there was no need for it. But with Hans, you know, they, if you notice in part three, they did try to give more Hans more of a backstory by telling about his brother and him, you know, but it was just not a ton of development between Hans and, and uh, you know, or kind of what, Hans, okay, he's a terrorist. You know, that's pretty much really all he got. And really, he wasn't even a terrorist as much as he was uh, at that point in the movie or at that point in time. He wasn't so much a terrorist as he was just a thief, you right. know, in, in general. And, you know, it, it, just because, I mean, you could see in the simple fact that, you know, he was trying to get a bunch of revolutionaries released that he read in a magazine just as a distraction. It was a distraction because yeah. he was a thief. Yeah, because he was a thief. But, you know, you get throughout that movie – and you start going through it, and, you know, John McClane's all over the place. He's like a monkey in uh-huh. that building. I mean, he literally is climbing up here and there. And I'm sorry, but that's a very tall building. And for him not using the elevator as much as I thought he they was. They shut him down. If you don't remember exactly. at the very beginning, they you shut all the elevators down. realize how many down. steps he had to get yeah. to the roof, you know? I mean, alone. But, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, a little bit of 30 a plot floors hole, or probably. whatever. Um, With no shoes, yeah. you know. He's going up several flights of stairs with no shoes on. You know, I mean, again, it's a plot hole and it's, it's minor. It's not, not not nothing that's a big deal. But you also kind of look at it. You're like, man, going up once, you'd be wor- worn out. Yeah. You'd be done. <laughs> you know, and and, and, and he, he wasn't like in the greatest shape. No, either. I no. mean, he was in pretty good shape. But yeah, I mean, especially coming off of moonlighting. I mean, that he, he couldn't have been in that good of shape. That's another there. thing. They were so nervous about bringing bring a Bruce Willis into. I mean, of, John McTiernan wanted. Uh, you know, an everyman, whereas, you know, studios wanted, like, Schwarzenegger. They yeah. want, they wanted the big names, yeah. action stars of the Especially 80s. coming off of Jean-Claude Predator. Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, 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 Arnold, they wanted. Um, 
Well, there's a couple others, but I mean, you know, like the mainstays of 80s action movies and everything. But, you know, John McTiernan's like, no, I want to action. Uh, I want to every man. And, you know, they, they like I said, you know, he was a comedian, uh, not a comedian, but, you know, he comes from comedy acting yeah. uh, in Moonlight. And he and does everything. it really well, even when he goes to comedy after, like, you know, the whole nine yards and stuff like that. I mean, he he plays he's not really comedic in that movie as much but he knows I mean, how to hit comedic yeah. beats i think he's um, very sarcastic actor too yeah but it, it's like i feel like he just left comedy behind which is fine because he's a great action star but you know in the first when they first started releasing posters they were so nervous about him they the posters just had the nakatomi building yeah. on him so they didn't have him but once he came out and people were like blowing up and like bruce bills is the best thing Phenomenal. since sliced bread yeah you know, then he started to become, then they put him on more posters as they yeah. started coming out more and more. And then mm-hmm. it was like basically just all him with Nakatomi Plaza in yeah. the background. So, you know, they never had much faith in him to begin with, but they did uh, give, uh, pay him like $5 million out of like a, I think it was like a 20 or 40 something million dollar budget. Might have been 40 something, but that's unheard of. For that movie, that, yeah. And for somebody who was unproven, like Bruce Willis, um, it made studios like Alan Ladd, who was with, I can't remember who he was with, but he had talked about who, how, you know, it, it made everybody nervous in Hollywood, the studios, because nobody was getting paid like that. Nobody was getting $5 million paychecks or whatever. And this guy was a nobody. You know, Bruce Willis yeah. was a nobody at the time. So they were like, you know, is this going to start making the the people that are in demand the action stars and or or just hollywood stars are they just going to start making them demand more money and everything you yeah. know and it ended up working and nobody complained because you know i guess you know john mctiernan saw something that nobody else did thank god for that because yeah i, I can't it, imagine so anybody else did. yeah and and he you know he, he just did such a great job with these films and 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 it's kind of hard to see him in anything else. Like I've watched plenty after, you know, Die Hard that he's been in like Red and you know some of these other ones that he's been in and and it just it's his greatest role in my opinion, you know. I mean, Die Hard is definitely and you know, I'm sure he's probably thinking the same thing down the road, you know, especially at his age now, it's probably like, yeah, Die Hard was really his his step up, you know, and and he hasn't really come down for, as far as that is concerned, you know, since then. You know, yeah. and and he uh he just that movie was just such a great movie and you know it was not at the time was not considered a christmas movie but now it is you know it and, should be because yeah. i mean you know you can have a, a movie that's not christmas movie it has a little christmas elements in the background but aren't considered this is full-on yes yeah. you have the title character writing little notes that says ho 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 on the dead dude that's awesome. dressing him up with oh, yeah. santa hat and everything um, he wrapped himself in like, or he used that special uh, wrapping tape, like the, the most Christmas iconic scene in the whole movie. They had the gun, yeah. you know, taped the gun to his back and everything like that. I mean, yeah, it's obviously a Christmas movie. It's just yeah. you know, people were like, well, and I think you can watch it any time during the year. I yeah. just enjoy watching it during December myself. That's right, just right, me, right. But, um, but yeah, you know, this. What would what would you say your favorite scene is from this movie? Um. I'd have to say probably when he jumps off the roof when he when he ties himself to the uh it's either that one where he ties himself or to the, the water hose. hose or the fire hose and jumps off the roof. I mean that was pretty iconic too. Or it's either the gun on the back or even when he's trying to go through the um the AC ducts and he and I mean that where he hits the gun in there and it comes off the loop, you know, it's it's kind of one. It seems such a real scene, you Wait, know, where he comes, where, where he wedges the gun in the air AC shaft to to basically go to a different level of the building. Oh, so in the fan, in, you mean? Yeah, yeah, and the fan okay. and, and everything else like that. But he, but then he wedges it in there to use it as a rope to oh, go in okay. there. You know, that was directly from the book. Okay, the Leland guy. He used the strap of a machine gun because yeah. he had the machine gun, and even in the the book, he he killed the guy. And he put, he wrapped him to that, or tied him to that chair, yeah. and said, "Now I have a machine gun." Yeah. Or no, he didn't say now. He says, "Now we have a machine gun." Yeah. It was just to throw off Hans or yeah. whatever. But uh, he said, "Now we," and he didn't do the ho ho ho. Yeah. Um, but that was just in the book. But in the movie, yeah, he once he had that machine gun, he used the strap of it to break uh, to to climb down into that shaft to jump into the the next shaft over. So that was actually pulled straight from the book as well. 
And that I, I just felt like that scene was so real. Like, like it wasn't like you know, see some action movies. They do some stuff that's you're like, there's no way in God's green earth that that would work. Like that well, he fell. Do you remember like whenever he goes to fall? Oh, he I know. Goes to catch, but then he falls and catches the next one. But, but that's that more was actually a, that was actually a mistake by the stuntman. Oh. He had actually fallen. And then, you know, they, they cut it to a used editing to cut it to where he grabbed the next one down. But they wanted to use it because, it, like you said, they wanted to use as much that se- made it seemed more realistic to go yeah. with the everyman realistic vibe of John McClane. Like any other action star, they'd be able to grab right on, right? Yeah. Well, he no, fum- that's what I'm saying. He that's, fumbled. He failed yeah. in that. And it, just by the skin of his teeth, caught onto the next yes. one. But yeah, I mean, that, but, I like that they use that if one. If you notice in, in all these movies, John McClane has a moment like that, you know, where it's just like, you're like, there's no way, like in uh, part uh, part three, you know, where he's get, about to get washed away in the water in the sewer and he grabs the the bar, the, the ladder just in time to climb up the uh, ladder yeah. when the water's push, pushing everything down. You know, I mean... Well, and then the ejection sheet, sheet in part two. Exactly. That, that doesn't exist in planes it, like exactly. that. Exactly. But that's what I'm saying. You know, things like that, you know, it made it made you feel like, oh, I don't know if he's going to make it. Okay, he's yeah. going to make it. You know, I mean, you knew he was going to make it, but it was, you know, you doubted yourself and you doubt yourself every time you watch scenes like that in these movies that they're like, oh, is he? Oh, well, I know he's going to make it. But, you know, I mean, it's so close, you know, and you're just yeah. like, ugh. I think my favorite. I think my favorite scene of this first movie, and it's just been become my my favorite scene in the last couple of years after I read that. Like, uh, the uh, it was the scene between Hans and 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 John when they're pretending not to know who the other yeah. is. You know, when they bump into each other throughout. Where the Hans movie. thinks he's smooth and he's going to get away with yeah, it. Yeah, but then John's John like, knows. ah, no, he's like, yeah, you don't have an accent, but you still yeah. sound the exact same. I mean, that's yeah. an Alan Rickman voice. I mean, you can't on, change now. that. That's an come iconic on. voice. But, I mean, in the sense of the movie, maybe John wasn't sure at first and he took precautions just yeah. in case because, you know, he gave him a gu- – he could have he could have just grabbed him yeah. and ended the whole thing, you know, yeah. tossed him out a window or something. Because, uh, obviously, he was stronger than Alan Rickman. Right, right. You know, so, I mean, if he had known that that was Alan Rickman, then he could have used him as a hostage with the other, yeah. uh, the yeah. other tool bags or whatever. So, I honestly think in that moment, he wasn't sure because a lot of people are like, oh, he was sure the whole time. I don't think he was. No. I mean, yeah, you got that voice, but I think in the sense of the movie, it was a matter of... Um, it was a matter of he put on this American accent, and because Hans is such a charismatic um, villain, yeah. and and Alan Rickman is such a talented actor, you know, it kind of he can kind of throw you off with an American accent. And the, the fact that he walked past that board and caught, uh, caught, you know, caught the name of somebody he could use to say, okay, yeah. I'm I'm this guy. And it wasn't even a, like a simple Dave type thing. It was William, but he said his name was Bill. So I mean, there was a lot thought out to it. Um, <clears throat> So, but that whole scene, that wasn't rehearsed between them two. Yeah. Because they wanted a sense of spontaneity to it. Yeah. Uh, feeling like they wanted the characters to feel uncomfortable around each yeah. other and the actors to feel uncomfortable around each other. Because before this, it was just them talking to somebody off stage and uh, into a walkie or whatever. But um, the fact that this wasn't planned and that they just started, you know, they're they like, okay, let's go right into it. And some of these shots that there and some of these scenes that they use could have been the first scenes they ever you know yeah. shot yeah uh you know even without practicing or anything i just thought it, it added that much of that much coolness to the movie yeah. and and when i when i i think i'd read that like a couple of years ago but um the fact that they had never rehearsed it and that they kind of fed off each other so much but you could i mean obviously you know uh, Hans knew who John McClane was, but you know the level of distrust between those two and how yeah. they're they're really playing chess right there in that moment. Well, that's what I was saying at you know the beginning of the podcast was that that he didn't trust anybody. Right. He didn't trust anybody. Like in, in a way, that's his character. You know, like he didn't even trust his own. He doesn't trust his own wife. He, he doesn't trust the doorman when he no. came in. The guy that was at the front uh-huh. desk. He didn't trust Akagi. Yep. He didn't trust Ellis. Uh-huh. Obviously. Yeah, and and he didn't even trust Argyle until he kind of got to know him a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, even then with Argyle, like you could see the look in his eyes, kind of like he was just looking him up and down, kind of saying, 
Uh, we'll see. But he wasn't we'll sure, you know, all this stuff about, you know, the rapping Christmas music. Yeah. But by the time he got there, he's like, look, man, here's my number. I'll stick around for you. Can't find anything. I'll take you somewhere where you yeah. need to go. And everything. Yeah. He's like, hey, you're all right, man. Yeah. Um, but, but then, then he, he hears that the captain, the Dwayne T. Robinson that's outside. And I'm sure he's known captains like that in NYPD. So, you know, he has no, no time for this guy yeah. or anything like that. And this Al Powell guy, you know, it's his first lifeline. Yeah. He has been desperately trying to reach yeah. out to the police. He's been desperately trying to reach out to somebody, you know. You know, it's it's you know, he's reaching out for somebody. And so finally this he finally has to throw a body on this dude's car to get yeah. him to recognize, like, <laughs> hey, there's some shit going down in yeah. here. And and so he's finally got somebody talk to talk to. Yeah. And it's like it's kinda like a, a sip of water for somebody in the desert or something. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's so refreshing to have somebody. So I think that's what helps really connect him with Pal. But then also, like you said, he has that trustworthy voice and they needed somebody like that in the movie. And yeah. maybe even a TV actor like Reginald Vell Johnson well, because he, he also had you know, he had a Reginald had had a very um you could tell his character Al had some deeper. He, he had some deepness to him, you know. Some some. No, sir, you couldn't drag me out of here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he just kind of like he had some sense about him. Like, yeah. have you noticed with all these movies, they almost make fun of cops and 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 law enforcement. Yeah, you know, in all these movies, in a way, you know, the the bumbling, alcoholic, divorced detective is the only one that can save the world right. you know and in almost every one of these movies and every single one of these like in the second one the, the i mean he can't stand the cops an idiot all the cops are idiots <laughs> but yeah that 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 scene at the end where she pulls the he pulls the watch off so we're we saying that that watch was holding hans up pretty much well i mean that's, I mean, that's wrist, like but, his main grip point i guess yeah and uh but then i guess he was able to slip right off but you know the interesting, uh, the most, most, you know, people talk about it all the time what happened behind the scenes with that scene, right? No, that really happened. Uh, some a stuntman. Uh, uh, well, the, the director hit. was like, "Hey, drop him on two instead of three. Yeah, because they wanted that real reaction from yep. him. And so poor Alan Rickman, his first his first endeavor into Hollywood movies, and uh, you know he's having to deal with the booby line, which was ad libbed by that that actor, and that's why if you look at Hans's face. Uh, or, or uh, Alan Rickman's face, you know, he he has kind of like a real weird, confused look. Yeah. That was a legitimate look from from Alan Rickman going like, "What the fuck?" Because he was like, you know, Hans, Bubby, yeah, and it, that wasn't that wasn't scripted, so that confused him. Also, the guns. Alan Rickman had never shot a gun, never been around guns, yeah, and so he winced every time the the gun went off. So if you'll notice when you watch the show, every time guns are being shot by Alan Rickman or whatever, it'll cut away right before the shot, and then cut right back to him right after. So yeah. because because he kept he kept you know oh you know wincing every time the the gun went off. He, he didn't wince with a with a uh, wand. I, I noticed no, he never winced with a wand. A wand. He never wand winced. Yeah, he never wand winced. Wand winced. So, but yeah, and then in the last scene, the the he's he's getting dropped. I think it was like twenty five feet onto an airbag, and uh, and he's like, they're, they're like, yeah, we're gonna drop you on three. All right, ready? One, two, and then right as they were saying two, they dropped him, and so he, you know, that look of surprise in Hans that's so iconic, yeah, that you see in so many different movies and or in whatever, slow motion, no less, slow motion. That first drop, that's the one they used, and that's the one that they tricked. No, not tricked him, but you know, you know, basically dropped him on two instead of instead yeah. of three. So yeah, that was a real legitimate reaction from Alan Rickman. He thought that since it didn't go off when it was supposed to, or he didn't drop when it was supposed to, he thought something had gone wrong. Now, which is it, a jackass move. It but, is. It is. I mean, trust Alan Rickman's acting. Yeah. You don't have to trick him into thinking right. he's about to die. Well, he did wince every time the gun went off. So I mean, that's... he was, but he's not a wand wincer. <laughs> no. So, so that very end, right? I know why they did it. What with but, Carl coming back? Yeah, I, I feel like it was in the book is that why yeah, I kind of felt he like came back in the book like that. I kind of felt like they did it so that Al could kind of redeem, come back. Yeah, from shooting that, you know, he did shoot that kid, but by doing this, he probably saved not only John McClane's life, but he probably, you know, that guy probably would have sprayed. Well, all you need over. you need one last little 
one last little stab right there, right? You know, you know, you need one last little, uh, you know, oh, hold your breath moment. What's about to happen? Is John? Yeah. You know, John's wrapped up in a blanket. There's nothing he can do. But they're surrounded by cops, so surely somebody's going to do something. No, but Al did, and he was like behind 16 other people, and so it helped him actually give all him way character to the right. development. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and I, I get that. I, I just kind of felt like that was kind of like a. I mean, I guess they're doing a I homage to the book, but I, I, I was like, okay. The guy was hung for a while. Yeah. Like, he was dead. I mean, there's no way that somebody could have survived that and, and you know, I don't know. I'm yeah. pretty sure his neck would have been broken at that point. Uh, and it sounded like it was. But, I mean, yeah, he was hanging there for, like, five minutes. And then when the people came running down from the roof, he was still hanging there. And so, uh, I don't know if they ever show, showed that chain without him hanging from it or whatever. But either way... Um, you know, obviously he pulled himself down and limped down Somehow. because he had a blanket around him. So they thought he was one of the hostages. Right. So yeah, and he had hidden his gun or something. But uh, he's uh, still after John was, McClane for killing his brother. So yeah. I guess that's where the, the that's where the motive came in because he could probably have gotten away. Something <laughs> you about know? brothers in these movies. Yeah, I know. So right? got the brother of the other one. <laughs> um, so getting into part two. Part two is my favorite. Yeah. Um, out of all the Die Hard movies, and I don't know if it's because it's snow and it actually looks like it takes place during wintertime and Christmas time. Because we're set in New York at this point. But I love movies like this. Yeah. I love movies where you got like a packed airport, but you got one guy going behind the scenes of yeah. how it all works. And you yeah. see all the belts and how it all works and everything. And uh, he's he's running around the airport because I've always thought just airports are just such magical places. And that was just, JFK Airport? No, it was in D.C. It was... Uh, oh, for some reason yeah, I was Dallas. thinking it was in... That's right, that's yes. right. Yeah, so... I'm thinking the third one, so that's where... Yeah, yeah. So this one, they were in D.C. I was... When I was younger, I thought it was Chicago. For some reason, I thought there was like a layover in Chicago or something like that because I just know the snowy weather and yeah. all that. But um, but yeah, it was in D.C. And um, I mean, it just picks up right, you know, the the, the the titles happen and then bam, we're we're watching his car get lifted up and John McClane's running out. Hey, 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 you know, he's back to every man status. Yeah, he's not the with bloody the guy car. in the vac in, yeah. in the the blanket, you know limping with his wife and everything got a nice he, pretty white sweater on exactly you know? and he seems happier than he was yeah. in the last movie and everything so you could tell like stuff has been worked out in his personal yeah. life so that's one thing that's maybe missing from this movie is that in the first movie he was not only having to overcome all that other stuff but he's also dealing with his personal stuff and not liking himself yeah and he was talked about that stuff to the al pal guy on the radio but in this one, you know, he seems to have gotten it worked out. You know, him and Holly are getting along when they talk on the phone. Because he's at the airport stuff. waiting for Holly to land. Right. And, to, and he's he's just gotten his mother-in-law's car towed, and they don't already don't <laughs> like him and all this kind of stuff. So, um, but you know, I you know, I think that's one element that was. Do missing you think from that was this. his mother-in-law's car, or do you think that's what they said? They yeah, said well, it's the mother. I thought that's what car. he said. So maybe he was just telling him so they wouldn't tow it. When in reality, it probably oh, no, was his piece of be, crap car. Because she said something like, uh, "Is when they were on the phone, and she said something like, uh, is she giving you crap about using her car? And he goes, oh, that's right. Not yet. <laughs> well, and on top of that, he lived in L.A. at the time. Like, he, he was did, just right. in, in, in waiting to pick her up. I guess, so. so I guess her family is from Washington or I something. Guess. Anyways, but um, I, I just really liked it. I like William Sadler's villain. Um, I... I, I I don't know. I guess there's just there's so much to be said about this. There's so much to you know, not to be said. Yeah, and this one's kind of uh, basically talking about you know how how easily you know big time you know we're talking career long military members are easily swayed towards communism. I guess or that was uh, that was one of my issues when I was watching this. Is like. You know, it's one thing for one or two people, but I guess when you work with like special forces, you all be kind of become the same way. You see some terrible stuff, and you want to be that, done that with it. Really I give a lot of credit just, to our military members in that. Not sense, these, so. not these particular ones. You know, not these special forces. I guess they're all scumbags, anyways. Apparently, you know, from what the way they act in the movie. You know, yeah. so uh, didn't didn't cuss words sound so much more harsh back in the eighties and nineties. Well, no, I thought it, like, there's it's, so much it's, more no, edge to him. I it, think it did in a way, but it was a lot more normalized in the '80s. Where now, like when you get into the '90s and 2000s, you know, there's it's a lot less. It's 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 weird because like in the '80s there was a lot more swearing and a lot more nudity, 
you know, in movies where in the 90s and 2000s, they pretty much just edited all that out. And I, that's probably where, you know, where when we started getting the rating system coming in. I just but, thought whenever William Sadler was like, she's like, do you have any words? He's like, yeah, I got two words. Fuck and you. But, I mean, just the way that it comes out. I mean, it's just like so yeah. cutting. I mean, it, it's, it's almost as like, man, they, they, they took those cuss words and they just chucked them as hard as they yeah. could at you. You know, I mean, they were really throwing them around. I just felt like there was so much edge to them. Back in those days, and it's just so much more like more of it, yeah. you know. It's just well, every other word, and it was so. But, but I mean, like nowadays, it's just so not normal, or it's just so. I don't know. It's just not delivered the same way. Well, and again, like I said, you know, I mean, there's less of it nowadays. You know, there's there there is some of it in there, you know, and you get the nudity and stuff like that. But it's just less nowadays, you know, where it's, uh, you know, I I feel like because you know the later on, you know, closest to 2000s and 90s they started getting a lot more uh, smarter pictures i guess you could call them you know yeah. a lot more thought pieces but you know one thing we forgot to talk about is should be like one of the main things we should have said on the for the first one is yippee kaye mother humper i want to see uh what was it we, uh, we didn't even mention that matt and there's so many of the 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 uh you know so many different versions of it on tv so you know they had the Kaye mother trucker. Now if you if you can go <laughs> you can go up on YouTube and you can find the TV versions of especially this movie Die Hard Part Two. Yeah, and find the dubbing that they do because of the language. The person they got to talk for for John McClane for Bruce Willis to do his overdubs because they they get to a point because there's so much cussing that they actually have to redub entire sentences yeah. that he speaks. Yeah. So for a good like five or ten seconds, you're listening to somebody that does not sound like John McClane <laughs> as John McClane's trying to talk and everything and and just the 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 <laughs> the censor the the words that they use to censor it's just it's hilarious uh, and like I think cracked after hours they, on their show they talk about that too. But, you know, it, it, it's, again, I, I'm surprised we didn't mention it, but, I mean, it is one of the most iconic things about Die Hard is, is that saying in particular, you know, and, and he, uh, you know, it, it's just kind of his battle cry, you know what I mean? And, and, and in, this, in this one, if you noticed his, everything's toned down with him. Uh-huh. You know, he seems a lot, a lot more at peace in a way, you know, because, again, his, like you were saying before, his, his home life, not his work life, but his home life was a lot more relaxed. Even his work life seemed a lot more chill and relaxed. An LAPD cop. Now. Yeah, and and so, you know, in this one, it, it seemed like a lot of it was toned down to a certain point, but the action definitely wasn't. It almost toned felt down. like 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 in the first movie, he was used to it because he's used to the gritty gritty streets of New York, yeah. you know, so he can be the tough guy. And then it seemed like, you know, he had a couple years maybe of LAPD, which, you know, I'm not saying LAPD, you know, that they don't have crime as bad as New York or whatever, but it just doesn't seem as gritty and as, as um, I don't well, know. But when you hear about, you know, back in the 60s, 70s and 80s and stuff like that, it was, you know. Crime Central was New York. You know, that's right, why right. all these that's movies are based at, off yeah. of crime and so he, he's, from New York. He's kind of been nerfed, like you would say, and he's now put in this situation. I, where, I wouldn't say nerf because I don't say that word. But, so. you know, he, he almost like he almost takes joy in getting back into it. Like he does. He, he does. very well could have like gone to the security. Now, obviously, these these two <laughs> tool bags that worked at the airport. Uh, one of them was uh, from um, NYPD, NYPD Blue. Blue. Yeah. Uh, oh, what was his name? Well, you, um, you know, you know, he was the first person to show bare ass Dennis Franz. That's bare it, ass on, on NYPD Blue. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, him and then his his stupid. I don't know traffic, why I know that. By the way, just saying traffic. But no, I had heard that too. But, um, but well, I think that's where the rating system actually came from uh, because of that. Have. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm just making stuff. <laughs> you like, uh, I think but, that, hey, that theory. would be cool if that's that's it's what a theory. happened. It's a theory. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's. You know, it, he he could have called, you know, other cops from outside the airport saying, look, I'm an LAPD cop and I see I've seen this guy that I'm pretty sure is on TV. Probably he could be a terrorist. I've seen guys with guns, suspicious packages. And you got this guy that's being shipped in uh, from his country, you know, that they're trying to break out. You know, this communist guy. First of all, shouldn't there be more security there? Shouldn't there be like armed forces there? But if, isn't it like Christmas Eve? I'm not. I'm not saying that. that, yeah, that makes still, it better. I just would think if they're they're if they're transporting uh, or they're extraditing a war criminal to the United States, you would think that you would have some kind of military oh, there. Or, I mean, I know the military doesn't yeah. have jurisdiction on 
and, and certain but also places they, and everything. They that, were trying to keep it on the low too. If you remember, they they weren't like but that's publicizing that you know when his yeah, you know, but he snap. knew yeah. Uh, well, because Bruce Willis even said you got you got this guy coming in here. Do you yeah. need me to paint you a picture here? Yeah, you know it was obvious to him, so he could have called someone. I just think that he took joy in getting back into the crap again you know he he makes a comment being under the tunnel is like how can the same stuff happen to the same guy twice and everything um but i i don't think and, and here's where it's different and it's different with the first two movies compared to the other ones the first well no because the third one had uh was involving his children's and his children's school but if you notice the first two it was him was constantly trying to yeah in in the third one it was he was worried that they were yeah it was one of his, his kids were at one of those possible school school well i know jules or julius or whatever his name is uh, yeah. samuel jackson yeah like nephews were in the school yeah. but, but, but what I, i'm I saying is were. like in the first two He's saving his wife. That's right. what he's doing, you know. And, right. and that's, he's not saving everybody else. His yeah. mission is to save his wife. Right. There, boy. And what are the ch- saving everybody else? And w- I'm sorry, but what are the chances? You know, you're getting, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Will, Will, William Atherton, uh, Thornburg, just so happens to be on the same damn pla- plane as his wife. Why wouldn't you tell these planes to go to other airports? Especially in Washington, no less. So, like, I get that some some planes may not have had fuel, right? But obviously, there was at least an hour or two before they had to start bringing planes down. Um, so that was an hour or two that a plane could have maybe gone to a nearby airport or something. But I think what it was is because it was a blizzard, right? You know, but it was a blizzard. But I mean, they could have they could have said, "Hey, look." If you come here, you're definitely going to die. Well, I, th- I think some of the planes did actually do that. I think a lot of a lot of the planes. What I'm ta- what I'm ta- sorry. What I'm talking about is just whenever they're like, you know, basically they give them that they give the air traffic controllers one more chance to get everybody lined up, and then they were going to cut off communication, and then the terrorists would be in charge. So the guy got on there. He's like, hey, just to let you guys all know, talking to all the planes, yeah. uh, we're just a little, uh, you know, congested up here. If you just get, give us a little while, we'll start landing you guys, basically, is what he said. And it's like, why wouldn't you use that time to say, terrorists have taken over the airport, go to a different airport. And they probably would have cut you off at that point. But then they would have known, we cannot land here, or they're yeah. going to kill us. Yeah, and then it would, but it also wouldn't be a good movie because then they're taking well, they're taking <laughs> away the reasoning for allowing you know, know. what happened. You but know, that's what I'm saying. This is what we do on I, our I show. Is, yeah. is well, why didn't they do that though? I mean, what, what, what I get the, that. What was the thinking on that? I guess maybe the storm thing, but I mean, I think they could have find found nearby airports that they could have flown over. Well, the I mean, it's Washington. Like I mean, you that. got Philadelphia. I mean, you got you got a lot of big airports Lots in the of area. Airports you know, in the area that New York alone. Yeah, you know, they could have just been like. Okay, and then you switch to another. Yeah, uh, you know, hey, you know. But you know, damn that. well, with cell phone invent the invention of the cell phone, none of this would have happened. None of this would have happened. I mean, they literally. You could have called somebody on that plane, and be like, "Hey, um, uh, you're on this plane. Yeah, because many uh, people we're stay prob- yeah. connected while they're on on the plane and everything." But didn't they have phones on the plane? She did, and that's what I was asking. Uh, that's what I was asking myself when I was watching because she called. She well, she paged him, and then he called her. Yeah. Um, but the fact that nobody was calling, I have to think that somehow those communications were down too. Maybe those communications used that well, dish they did take that they control, took out yeah. that, that they took control over, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know how all that works, but it's. I, I just had to kind of say, okay, <laughs> you know, just go with yeah. it during the movie. But um, I love the. I love the ridiculousness of it sometimes. You know, you got the two different special forces yeah. and they're changing out their magazines, one's blue, one's red. You're just like, okay, this is extremely obvious. Especially when they're they're not revealing yet, but they're like, We got a situation here <laughs> and they take out their red magazines and put in blue magazines. And then in the that bad guy's lair, the guy's like, You guys know what to do. They take out the blue or take out the On red the ones and put in the blue ones and you're just like Okay, now they have the same magazines. Like this is obviously they're working together. Yeah, you know there was no twist there. And then John McClane ejecting out of that airplane that he has no business ejecting from. That airplane. You do realize how iconic that scene is. As I well, know, right? But I mean, that airplane. The the reasons for jetpacks is for planes that you can't just walk out of, right? But they use that's that, a yeah, plane that you can yeah, just walk out of yeah. and jump out of parachute or whatever. 
And uh, you, when you saw that, you're just like, they don't have they don't have ejection seats. But, I mean, I guess it works for the movie. But how did the bad guys not you, see him eject out of that damn plane? Well, they did. Movie? They did, remember, because as soon as it blew up, and he was like, Argh! yeah, it went up to the sky, and then he uh, parachuted, and they're like, something like, you lucky mother or something. Yeah. Something like that. But, but you think they'd chase him or, you know, find something, out where I think is. the cops were on their way or something. But, you know, it was, it was just interesting. You know, I guess you could say, well, it was a modified plane where that – that's the ceiling of that thing pops off and yeah. you can eject out of I'm it. I'm pretty sure that, that that scene was on the trailer too, the original trailer. I mean, that's why I think it's it's probably the most iconic it's it's definitely the most iconic scene throughout the whole entire film in my Yeah, opinion. yeah, in part 2, yeah, so yeah. the most iconic of part 2. Just like it was just on like trailers and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, like just like say. Alan Rickman, same thing that was on the trailer too. But Alan, Alan Rickman, I, I well, no, I can't say that because they would well, that wouldn't make sense to put that on the trailer because that's literally like the last scene you know but uh you know that that's alan rickman's scene is the most iconic of the first one and then in that third one it, or the second one is definitely him ejecting from the plane and it just it, it to me this general like he's supposed to be this military member but i mean he pretty much kicks, colonel yeah the colonel yeah. the communist guy he pretty wait, much wait. Are we talking about General Esperanza or William yeah. Sadler? No, no, character? no, General Esperanza. Okay. And then uh, the Sadler character, who what, what was he doing? Colonel like martial Stewart. arts or something? Yeah, you know? he was. He knew some kind of. But that that was what I was wondering: is like, how do they have a connection to this general? Did they? Is was he like somebody they were fighting against? Yeah, yeah. No, and he, they came to believe the same he as he it. did, or he something. He mentions oh, it. Oh, did he? Okay, I must yeah, because uh, Sadler mentions the fact that uh, you know they they were supposed to go there and. Uh, um, attack this general, but somehow their ideals ended up lining up, and so he, uh, they ended up, you know, springing him and all this other stuff. But you know, it was because basically it was it was all about money. You know what I mean? He called John McClane a pendejo cop. Yeah, That's pretty funny. <laughs> but, but that is pretty funny. But you know, it, all these movies, all these bad guys, you know, are supposed to be these crazy terrorists. Comes out with these extensive, you know, plots and plans and everything else all just to steal money i mean that's you know they're saving this general so that he could give them money and 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 live on a beach you know in his country yeah while he rules that country and then just basically gives them a bunch of money and a and bunch the fact of land that these people think they're always going to be sitting on a beach hans gruber this guy or whatever i mean it never works out I mean, you have like international agencies working together to track you down i mean there are I mean, maybe back then it was yeah. easier. Like and nowadays, you cannot hide in this world. No, they'll send the rock it's after a, you. It's a, you know, it's like if you steal a hide. bunch of random ass cars in in California. You mean if you start out as car thieves and yes. you end up being secret agents somehow? Yeah, and then they'll send the rock after you to get you. You know, <laughs> but uh, such terrible. <laughs> that that huge plot hole there. By the way, but, hey, let's make a deal. Let's never talk about Fast and Furious okay. on the show. Oh man, I don't know. I love the Fast and Furious <sighs> movies though. I like Part Five. That's about it. Yeah, that is a good one. And but, the first one. The first one you know when they were actual street racers yeah and not yeah. secret agents and and but you know like i said it just with they're they're all just thieves you know even in the third one you know hans's brother is just but basically he had a little bit steal. more substance to his well because his yeah fund. he was a thief as well yeah but also he was sticking it to the american government and funding and his revolution stuff funding it and he was getting revenge for the man who yeah. killed his brother so i mean I, he I, was I, able I, to kind of roll that up into a nice i know that said and everything but. i know that was said but i feel like that yeah, he did the John McClane. He brought John McClane in there, but maybe a little bit. But I, I feel like that wasn't even really a big deal for him, you know, in the third one. Like, yeah. it, I think he used that as just kind of a cover in, a, in, in sorts, you know what I mean? And, yeah, he was toying with him. He was playing Simon Says with him. But at the same time, I think it just boils down to money, you know yeah. what I mean? And just with all these movies, it always boils down to money and power in some sort of way. And money gets power, you know, begets power or whatever. I just... I just feel like they stopped being Die Hard movies after part two. You know, the third one, obviously, they wanted to make a third Die Hard movie. Um, and uh, this mo and Die Hard 3 and Die Hard with a Vengeance, it started out as a movie called Simon Says. Yeah. And um, they wanted to turn it. I think we talked about this with the Horror and Heels ladies. Yeah. But um, they wanted to make another Die Hard movie. They got this movie and they thought, look, we just have to change a couple things, a couple of the villain's motivations, and it fits perfectly with... A die Hard movie, but we'll just have instead of this person that John McClane checks in with every once in a while, we'll actually have him running around with yeah. him and have him be a legitimate, as you say, sidekick or yeah. partner or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, so it was obviously meant to be, kind of be like almost like a buddy cop ish type yeah. movie, but they turned it into a diehard movie, and they turned into the main character instead of being some Simon guy who wants to steal stuff. Then they turned into Hans Gruber's brother. So um, I think you know in that that it wasn't started out written as a diehard movie. Yeah. You miss a lot of the, the of what makes John McClane John McClane. You miss a lot of what makes diehard movie a diehard movie. I'm not saying it was a bad movie. It was a great movie, Die Hard with a Vengeance. And, you know, Live Free and Die Hard, that, you know, it has some good moments and every, everything in it, but it didn't feel like a Die Hard movie, and neither did with a Vengeance. The, the, the ones where he spends a lot of his time alone, like in part one and part two, um, and he's trying to overcome stuff. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Yeah, I, 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 I get that. I think that's, a, you know, like they're good action movies. They're just not Die Hard action movies. And, and you're, 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 I didn't even think about it that way, but in, in, in all reality, the first two are the only ones where he's really kind of alone. You, yeah. you know, yeah, he talks to his partner, you know, Al and, and, and things like that, you know, and he does, he does Check have in a, with people every once in a while yeah, in part two, but, but, but you're right. Nobody in wants that. to listen to him. So he's got to go do it by himself. Yeah, you're right in that where, where all the other movies he's, he's got the sidekick with him, right. you know, and, and he's very exposed. He's yeah. very around other people. He can go into a store and grab a drink if he's thirsty. He can, you know, get this or that. He can, you know, go find a, you know, if they're running down the street, he can stop at a pawn stop, show his badge, and grab some guns and, and ammunition from there. Yeah. In those first two movies, he was limited. You know, he yeah. had they, they wanted to take his gun away and when he was in the airport. He only had a pistol when he was in the building. So he's limited in what he can do, whereas in those other movies, like I said, with the third movie, Definitely wasn't Die Hard because that was written to be something else and it was turned into a Die Hard movie. And then the others were just kind of like just playing off of Bruce Willis's stardom, really. Well, and, an and also, star. too, if you think about it, you know, where it made it different, too, is that, you know, he was in his own sandbox mm -hmm. in New York. Yeah. You know, he was he was that was home field for him. So maybe in a way that that kind of made it also not kind of like a, a diehard where the first two fish he, out of water element yeah. you know he's in LA he's in DC yeah. or whatever yeah and, and nobody you know, took his badge seriously right and in the fourth the fourth one he he technically starts out in New York and then he moves to you know what what is it uh Washington yeah and then in the and nobody cares about it you know it's like oh you're some cowboy cop from New York yeah. nobody cares about that and yeah. the second one nobody cares about what you did in Nakatomi Plaza yeah. and it's yeah. like so like nobody cares about what he does or that the fact that he's overcome these. But he situations still does it every single time, yeah. and he comes through every single time, you know. And and that's where I feel like he tends to make. That's why he. It's good story development, good storytelling, is because it's it's basically like taking a, a pit bull and putting it with a bunch of chihuahuas. Well, not only know, that, or, but you were stuck in a structure. In the first one, you were stuck in the Nakatomi building. In the second one, you were stuck in the airport. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's snow all around. You can't leave. But he can't leave because his wife's there anyways. Yeah. But he's got this certain area to work in. He does, He can't yeah. go anywhere else to get any other help. You know, he can't go to another airfield to take off and help people land or whatever it may be. You know, uh, you know, he's stuck in this one complex. So, I mean... I, and, and I feel like, you know... Um, and I say and I've said this since uh, since day one of this podcast is I I seriously feel like what makes good movies. I knew you were going to say this. One of one of the good things about good movies is the scenery. the 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 scenery becomes a character. You know, like Nakatomi Plaza. Everybody that grew up in the eighties and nineties knows what Nakatomi Plaza is. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a character. That airport, the snow, the scenery, stuff like that, that's that's a character. You know, it move it helps move the plot along. It helps make the plot better. You know, and uh you know, in the third one you had New York City. You know what I mean? Fourth one you you know, New York City, I mean, that's just one of the most iconic sceneries in all of film, you know, yeah. is New York City. And and with this one, it's you know, you have the snow. Again, snow and blood just mix. It really does. I mean, it's totally you know, when when you got blood, you know, like a lot of horror films, you know, yeah. when they when they bring in snow, it's it's a lot more impactful, you know, yeah. than than without it, you know, in a, in a way because I mean it just shows it, you know, like Sin City movies like that really kind of show the colors and and different things that make the scenery great, you know, and and this one, you're at an airport, you know, it's it's a character in the film, you know, being that airport is a character in the film, and and in all these great movies have the great 
scenery and great lines and great lines <laughs> yeah. because i mean like from the second movie you know they had that you're just the wrong place uh, the wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah that like sums up john mcclain yeah. at least in the first movie and here in the second yeah and if they continued it'd be like the same thing right i or mean yeah. if, if say you had you know you had the same thing at you know an airport in la it probably wouldn't be as impactful as the scenery of you know in in a blizzard at an airport right in Washington, you know what I mean. It's just, it's just not. It's less impactful, you know. And I've said, I'll, I'll continue to say that, you know, what makes good movies are not just the characters or the storytelling. It's the scenery and the and the, the costumes and things like that. You know, stuff you're looking at. You know, it makes, you know, what every time it seems like John McClane ends up in. He has like at least you know uh, several different costume changes during a movie. You know what I mean, like. In the first one, yeah, not so much, kind of, but it's always like he's losing clothing. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. And like in this one, he and he William, ends up in, in this that, one, William Sadler s- again. Uh, starts out with no clothing. Yeah, and eventually gets more and more. With so his weird. That was like the weirdest. Well, that's Rennie Harlan now. You know, yeah. and you know, you got Rennie Harlan who is coming off of probably what I think is the 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 best or most enjoyable nightmare uh, movie is Part Four. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Dream Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, um, my favorite one. No, yours is part three, Dream Master. Dream Masters, that's right. Uh, yeah, 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 mine the the Dream Warriors, the part four. Um, that one was you know Rennie Harlan. That's the one where she turned into a cockroach and got stuck in the Bug Motel or whatever. That was and, so corny. And but I mean, he like he was, was uh, good, that man. that was like his first major film, you know, yeah. in America and stuff. But then he got then he got tapped to do stuff like this. So you kind of see like the eccentricities and. Yeah, and different things like having somebody to start out. I mean, it's effective. Yeah, it's because you're like, what the heck is going on? This is weird and everything. But so, what was your favorite part in this movie? Um, let's I see. think it might be the same one mine is, or the around around about. Let me think about it. I really liked him talking to Al Powell on the phone. Uh, but let's see. Oh, I had one. Mine's the church scene. You know, that where where they're at the church. You know. Uh, and and they got and the suddenly the military is behind John yeah and, and bad mouthing Carmine or whatever uh-huh. Dennis and then, Franz guy and then you got the you know the snowmobiles going around and he's using snowmobiles to kill people and you know I mean it's it's just I, I thought that was such because it was pitch black it was dark I mean you had the Christmas lights which kind of gave it the impact you know that you really were looking for you know but with the guns blazing and the snowmobiles going and and you know that whole church scene was just uh, you know their base of operation yeah. was just it was, it was just the fact that you know John McClane found it. You know they were, just, you know these are black ops, you know military members and a New York City uh, detective. I really, well, I really like him jumping on the the, the plane and you know doing that was the, pretty cool and doing that that whole thing and the the whole ending and how they were able to bring everybody down. I, I you know I think the 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 best scene of the movie is you know besides having the little cameo of the T one thousand going. You know, what do I look like here? And he goes, a sitting duck. Do you remember that part? Yeah. The T-1000 just <laughs> shot him. And I think that, like, the T-1000 almost survived that that scene if it wasn't for John McClane. But, I, you know, I think the scene where John goes back into the police, um, the airport police station or whatever, yeah. and uses the blanks and starts shooting yeah. at the Dennis Franz guy, and he just looks so coward uh-huh. and afraid. Like, he's got his arms up, like, oh, my God, oh, my God. But he was like, these are the blanks, like, how quickly would John have gotten shot in that scene? Oh, nowadays by the other all the other cops uh, around yeah. him, and he's like, you know, and everybody's bringing out their guns, but like nobody shoots him, you know. So I, I thought that was really weird, but it was cool because you know you've seen this guy be a prick throughout the whole movie, the cop, the Dennis Franz guy, and he just will not listen because. John McClane's cooler than he is, and he doesn't like that, and so he's like, well, this it's is- like the cop from the first one, yeah, you so know? Like, this is my show, this is my yeah. deal, this is my jurisdiction, all this kind and of his stuff. brother's an idiot. But it was funny, because it was like, that was or the cousin. only thing to wake him up from, as yeah. John would say, the lead in his, uh, yeah. the, the lead, uh, wait, was it lead in his ass, the shit in his brains, or whatever. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, it took something like that. Like, look, they were using blanks. These were the guys. He's like, oh, get the hell out of here. And he shoots him with a gun. He's like, ah. Oh. So, I mean, that, I think that was pretty impactful and it helped to turn. It was a believable way because you're like, this character is either going to be a, a, a prick the rest of the movie yeah. or he's going to have something to get him on John's side. But what would get somebody that's that much of a prick 
on yeah. John's side. Him shooting him with a gun, a fake gun or whatever, it scared him so much. It made him kind of reset in his head. Okay, yeah. priorities here. Let's take out. And plus, he just had the military guy like chew his butt out at the church, the cop guy. Yeah. And so he would like nothing more than to be able to go arrest that guy or yeah. kill that guy. You know. Well, and I kind of feel like you know at the beginning, you know, where um, they're back in the in the room that sorts the luggage mm-hmm. and everything. You know, you kind of feel like, especially nowadays, especially after 9-11 and stuff like that, you know, that airport would have been shut down. Oh, yeah. Completely shut down. All those planes would have been told to go to a different airport. You can't that have airport. 80s and 90s action no. movies nowadays. No. That, that, that scene and the shooting and everything else in that sorting room would have shut down the airport completely. Even that, especially, I mean, the military finding out that something like that happened at that airport, they would have rerouted that plane. I guarantee Well, that's what I'm saying. They would have rerouted that plane, and then they would have found a way to well, talk to the other plane. Well, that I mean, that happened very early on, you know, where they still had communication with the planes. Right. Like I said, they would have shut that. Nowadays, especially after 9-11, they would have shut down that airport completely. Yeah, that's kind of what I was asking. Like, how hard would it be to just be like... Terrorists have taken over land somewhere else. I mean, it exactly. takes two seconds yeah. to say, and they can cut you off after yeah. you say it, but they won't cut you off before you say that. Terrorists have taken over the airport land somewhere else. And if they would have shut you down and said, oh, you know, that was just, you know, you could have even said, uh, and and they're using our frequencies, so don't believe anything you hear after this transmission. Yeah. You know, it's 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 one of but those things. But then it would have been a good movie then. Yeah, you know, cause really. then, but then you're relying on pilots to go and navigate and find a different airport to go to and everything. There's got to be rule books on you this. They've, they've got to be, you know. Even if you're flying somewhere contingency south. Contingency after contingency. Yeah, and landing you know? in like a, a street field or, or a field something, or something. Yeah. You know, it's, it's better than knowing you're going to die if you try to land at that airport. Now, having that reporter on the plane you know in all reality in this movie in part two he kind of helped but it's so unrealistic like i was it's very unrealistic because why would he be in dc of all chances of all times why would he he would be in dc at the time not only at the time that those two were there but at the same same plane now it could have been coming from la which they're both from that makes sense but and it's the holidays yeah, but, but why why would he be going to yeah. D.C. for the holiday? I don't know. It's just, I guess you could say maybe he got some national acclaim off of that, and so he's going to Washington for, you know. Well, he's got know. a restraining order on her, so he didn't have a lot of uh, fame because he looked like an idiot off the first one. But but that set, but, yeah. but, the, but the thing is, is he kind of had some sort of redeemable quality in this movie and in, in not redeemable quality but he was kind of somewhat redeemed i mean yeah he was still putting out a well he just caused everybody to go into a panic and chaos at the airport but he was kind of alerting other people too you know and yeah. you would think that you know him talking to his news station they would have been like yeah you need to tell those guy the the pilot to go somewhere but else. what that might have done is they they could have figured out the carriers could have figured out which plane that was and brought that plane down for him him saying those things but i don't know either way i really enjoy part two that's yeah. my favorite what would would you say part one or part two is your favorite or part three to be perfectly honest i mean i love the classic don't get me wrong that first one but i still got to go back to part three part three i i can objectively say that part one is definitely the better movie out of oh all yeah of them. yeah you yeah. know it's it's obviously Barnett. it's the best part uh and and I could probably, you know, years from now, if I watched it all these over and over and over, the first one is probably the only one I'd like afterwards because these yeah. other ones would just get tiring after a while and you start to know or realize more of the mistakes if you're watching them over and over again. But uh, I just like part two because of the snow, because he works with a couple people, but he's like in the inner workings of the airport, which I always think is cool. Um, and you know William Sadler just plays an amazing yeah. uh, bad guy. I like creepy, him in this. but but he's good. Yeah, you know you you believe that he's an evil who he is SOB. and everything. Um, you know it's it's got all the '80s tropes with the, the same type of score in it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I I just I, I really enjoyed part two, but part one is amazing too. And anybody who's trying to say that these aren't Christmas movies and aren't watching them during December, you're missing out on a special experience. Yeah. Because if you're watching them as Christmas movies, you get a whole new experience out of them. I guess I'd yeah. say, but um, I would say definitely watch this. Um, I uh, you got to watch part two right after if you watch part one, uh, because they're both kind of take place at Christmas, and none of the other Die Hard movies do that, but. Um, but these two do, and I think that they're very special. 
uh, movies because they're not the typical Christmas movies you see, but they're one of those ones that are up there that, that are, are a must watch around yeah. Christmas time. Yeah. Then there's a lot of and films like that. If that anybody are, knows us, they know that we love yes, Christmas. Absolutely. And it is it is a Christmas movie. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I'll, I'll watch it any time throughout the year, but I seem to f- find myself watching it more during the Christmas season. So. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I had a good time talking about this. We didn't really dig into it too much. Um, you know, a lot of things have been said about the Die Hard movies, but we did want to talk to about them a little bit. You know, things that we like about them, uh, and just have our own little conversation about it. Uh, definitely watch these movies. Uh, rent them if you can. Uh, hell, I'd even say buy them if you can. They're worth worth having. They're one of these uh, movies that. Um, I don't know if they'd say they're timeless because, you know, you could tell that they are dated with certain things, but they're still just as enjoyable as they were back then yeah. um, and uh, definitely worth the watch. Um, but if you guys want to get a hold of us, uh, our email address is uh, the post credit podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on uh, so all social media as uh, the post credit podcast. Uh, except for Twitter, we're at the post credit. Uh, we have a website. Website it's www.thepostcreditpodcast.com. Uh, check us out on there. Um, send us an email. Send us a message on social media. Let us know uh, any other holiday movies that you guys like to watch during the holidays, uh, or any other '90s movies that you like to watch, uh, because that's what we're trying to hit during this season. And uh, you know, next month we have uh, our uh, our '90s teen movie uh, month that we're going to do. So. Uh, give, shoot us some messages. Let us know what your favorite 90s teen movies are, teen comedies, teen dramas, whatever they may be. Uh, let us know what they are. Um, and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll talk about those as well as some of the other ones that we're talking about. Um, but we appreciate you guys listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. And yippee ki mother trucker. Yippee-ki-yay, mother trucker.